Welcome back to DC to Daylight. My name is Derek and in this video I obviously want to talk about antennas. So antennas are one of those things that are really fun to make and it gives you this sense of accomplishment just throwing a little bit of math at this thing and just cutting it to the right size and attaching a wire to a radio, maybe your Wi-Fi to extend your range or something like that. It's easy to do and the rules of physics apply for 100 kilohertz all the way up to you know 100 gigahertz. Uh, so you're not limited to any particular band. Anything you learn here today will be relevant for all of those frequencies. Now we're also going to do an interesting physics demonstration with this little light bulb and this antenna here and we're going to kind of examine what the electromagnetic field is actually doing. Okay, so we'll look at polarization, we'll look at the field intensity and where this kind of uh, antenna actually uh, propagates that RF energy. Now where I'm lacking in knowledge, uh, I've asked an expert to come in and fill in the gaps. That is Sterling Mann. Uh, he's an amateur radio operator like myself. He actually works in the field of RF uh, and antennas, so I've asked him to come on and kind of explain um, a little bit about that. So our conversation went on for quite a bit. Um, so I've cut this up and put uh, relevant parts of uh, that discussion in here. A link to the full uh, discussion between he and I are down in the description so you can check it out there. All right, so enough jibber jabber, let's get right into antennas. Antennas are all around us. We use them to transmit and receive things like music, communicate with aircraft. They're used in guidance systems, GPS, satellite comms, cell phones, and IoT devices to name a few applications. Those applications all operate on specific frequencies within the RF spectrum. And that frequency dictates the physical size of the antenna and its propagation characteristics. The lower the frequency, the longer the wavelength, and the higher the frequency, the shorter the wavelength. In general, any radio frequency can be received via what is called the line of sight. This goes for VLF, HF, VHF, UHF, so on and so forth. That means there's a clear path from one antenna to the other, and the only attenuation in that pathway typically comes from moisture in the atmosphere, precipitation, vegetation, or overzealous squirrels storing nuts for winter. We're all familiar with typical Wi-Fi performance at 2.4 gigahertz. This is a fairly short wavelength, so antennas can usually be fitted to a circuit board trace internal to the device. However, you've probably noted that the range is severely limited and items around the house can block your signal. Now, old school electronics usually used a lower frequency requiring ridiculously long antenna. From back in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, the shortwave and AM bands were considered high frequency. And as technology advanced, we came to understand how to design and integrate systems utilizing shorter and shorter wavelengths, and as a result, antennas became smaller. All that being said, when it comes to long-range communications, lower frequencies still win out, longer wavelengths, right? As they aren't as susceptible to attenuation as UHF and microwave signals. In fact, it's very common at HF, 3 to 30 megahertz, to take advantage of bouncing radio signals off the ionosphere and the Earth itself in order to communicate around the globe. So I want to thank uh, Sterling Mann, call sign N0SSC, for coming on the channel and helping us understand and fill in the gaps about uh, what I can't explain intelligently. Um, so uh, Sterling, you are a ham radio operator. You've got your own YouTube channel. You've got a blog, N0SSC. I think it's .com. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Okay. And you are an uh, actual RF engineer, correct? <laughs> yeah, I try. Proof I'm a ham. Here's my QSL card with the VLA uh, awesome. picture. Um I think Paul Hardin, NA5N, he's an engineer who develops the receivers at the radio observatory, the very large array in New Mexico, famous from contact and stuff. And I had the opportunity to work there, work with him and learn a lot. And now, you know, that led me into a career in um, uh, the defense industry, which is where basically all of the cool RF stuff is. So I'm going to, I'm going to, from my perspective, you're an expert and uh, hopefully you can fill in these gaps. So what is an antenna? In the case of a transmitting antenna, it's a kind of transducer that can transform an oscillating electrical signal into an electromagnetic wave which can propagate through space. This same antenna can usually be used as a receiver as well. This is called reciprocity. Many of the topics we'll cover will apply to both receive and transmit applications, though there are some subtle differences we'll touch on later. An important concept to understand before we get into this is the wavelength and frequency relationship as it pertains to antenna physical size. So in a vacuum, our RF signal travels uh, at the speed of light denoted as C, and the antenna size is usually some fractional value of wavelength of the signal we're operating on. Wavelength is defined as lambda is equal to the velocity of propagation C divided by the frequency in hertz. Note that this is the theoretical wavelength in a vacuum using the speed of light as a constant. 
Light and radio waves are both electromagnetic radiation after all. In the next video, we'll show why this theoretical value doesn't exactly match up in the real world, and we'll have to tweak our antenna a little bit. We can also find the frequency from the wavelength. So we algebraically switch things up, and we find that frequency is equal to C divided by the wavelength. And of course, if we were hanging out in a vacuum chamber, we could prove that the speed of light is as currently defined as 299,792,458 meters per second using the formula C is equal to the frequency times the wavelength. That's not a task I'm personally interested in. So what does all of this tell us? As the frequency goes up, the wavelength decreases, and as the antenna's physical size is directly linked to the wavelength, as we said, our antenna size requirement gets smaller as well. The simplest of all antennas and the building block of many other antennas is the dipole. It's composed of two radiating elements, both one quarter wavelength in length, separated by a short distance at the center. The overall length being one half lambda, or one half the wavelength. From a transmitting perspective, we would connect one side of our signal source to one element and the other side to the second element. When we drive this antenna with a specific AC signal, it transforms this oscillation into both an alternating electric field and 90 degree orthogonal magnetic field. These fields exist together and allow the radio wave to travel through space to be intercepted by a receiving antenna. Hi, future me here. So I was just about to turn my video in and I thought I was done talking about everything, but I realized that I didn't really set the groundwork for Maxwell's equations, which are integral, <laughs> integral to understanding how electromagnetic waves propagate through space. Okay, so Sterling and I talk about these things and we're throwing terms around, but I don't really explain what it is. So let's just go through a few of the uh, rules of Maxwell's equations on the computer over here. The first equation we'll look at relates to the magnetic field. It reads the divergence of a magnetic field is equal to zero. So what does that mean? The funny looking triangle called the nabla and also the dot represents the magnetic field lines that flow through a closed volume of space. The B term represents the magnetic field direction and intensity. Overly simplified, this formula means if we take a chunk of space and a certain amount of flux enters that volume, the same amount exits that volume. The difference between the two is zero. This is important as it shows all magnetic fields are dipoles in nature. They have a north and a south pole, and the lines of force must complete a circuit. The second formula deals with the electric field component. It says the divergence of the electric field E is equal to rho divided by epsilon zero. Rho is the charge density, so how many electrons are piled together or not piled together in our space. In this case, an electric field begins at a positive charge and ends at a negative charge. Now let's take a finite and closed volume and place a charge inside of that container. We can see that with a positive charge, there are more field lines exiting than entering. And in the case of a negative charge, there are more field lines entering than exiting. So in this example, the electric field is non-zero, or rho divided by epsilon zero. We recall that rho is the charge density, and epsilon zero is a constant known as the permittivity of free space. It tells us how electric fields behave in a dielectric. The third formula is a bit more complicated. It says that the curl, the right triangle x bit, of the electric field is equal to the rate of change of the magnetic field. So this one tells us that the electric field can't exist without a magnetic field and also depends on a fluctuating B component. That's as far as I'd like to go with this one, but the important point is an electric field can't exist without a magnetic field and vice versa. Now this last equation says the curl of the magnetic field depends on a changing electric field. Note the mu zero, which is the permeability of free space. Think of it like the permittivity, but for magnetics. It's also a constant. And we've also got a new term, J, which represents current flow, also called the displacement current. The right-hand rule applies here, so this formula tells us which direction the lines of force are flowing in relation to the current. All right, so now that we've gotten that out of the way, well, let's get on with it. Without going beyond the scope of this video, we'll trust in Maxwell and say that our magnetic field cannot exist without an electric field. These two fields are both orthogonal or 90 degrees to each other as they propagate through space. Can I already say that? I already said that. So now we know we have an E field and a B field that can travel through space, and we know we have an alternating current and voltage on our antenna that generate those fields. How does that actually occur? I was a little fuzzy on this, so it was one of my things that I wanted Sterling to clarify. So let's see what he has to say about this. Mm -hmm. uh, what I wanted some clarification on, this is kind of the black magic side of things from my perspective, is what happens at the transmission line uh, antenna interface and how does, uh, I guess we're just wiggling electrons back and forth, how does that translate to propagating RF? So that the, the, the real answer to that question is obviously the wave equation, the, 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 and it's obfuscated by like the whole Maxwell's equations thing. And, and mm -hmm. I am, 
I know what they are, but I'm not at the point where I want to tattoo them on my body and say like, yeah, this is the <laughs> Ampere's law. This is, you know, Faraday's law. But um, in a nutshell, that's what's happening is the electrons are wiggling. The charges are wiggling. They're being accelerated. The keyword there is an accelerated charge um, through the transmission line. And even through the transmission line, it gets to antenna. So say we're looking at a dipole where you have, you know, you're you know, balance wire transmission line, and then it goes to two equally, you know, equal length pieces of wire. Right. It goes up there and it starts influencing the charge on that piece of wire. That's the key is a charge, an electron or whatever is accelerating back and forth. And because of the um, um, wave equation, which is derived from Faraday's and Ampere's law, um, and, and it's really hard to say, it's really kind of mis unintuitive to say because of an equation that we come up, um, but, you know, maybe the better term is because of the natural laws of the universe, when you move a charge, it propagates its field. So a charge has a field. And if you accelerate a charge, it, you know, the field moves with it. And if you move it back and forth, that field kind of reverberates. There's some really good diagrams out there that kind of show the intuitive kind of look, but it's basically the same. I think of antennas as a loudspeaker for uh, instead of air, uh, instead of, you know, a speaker moving air and, you know, changing pressure in air, essentially a very similar thing is going on. But uh, instead of um, air, it's electrons being able to sense or know in, in kind of an anthropomorphized way what the other electrons are doing and then continually, you know, propagating out into infinity. Um, so... At the interface, um, Ampere's law, I think people in electronics are, are familiar with that right hand rule, right? We send a charge going a certain direction mm -hmm. and we wrap our hand around it and the flux lines go this direction. That's uh, primarily the magnetic component, right? Mm -hmm. What is What tells us what the, uh, I guess, electric field component, because the uh, propagating RF signal is an EM wave, right? It has a, yeah. a magnetic component and an electric field component. So what what is that? <laughs> So that also stems from, you know, Maxwell's equations. And, and I kind of want to use the, the, the near field, far field idea of an antenna okay. to kind of decompose where the fields are actually coming from. So when you're really close to an antenna, my hand's the antenna. Um, and if you're really close means within about two wavelengths. So you take your frequency okay. that has a certain wavelength based on the speed of light. So let's call 100 megahertz has a wavelength of about three meters. So if you're within six meters of a antenna that works at 100 megahertz, that's the near field area. What's happening there in that in that uh, region is the um, synthesis, if you will, of the electromagnetic wave. So both the electric field and the magnetic field. Well, unfortunately, this video turned out to be much longer than I had originally planned. And there's a lot of information to cover, so we had to split it up into two different parts. We did get a chance to give a very cursory overview of Maxwell's equations and provide some idea of the coexistence of electromagnetic and electric fields and kind of how they work together to propagate uh, RF through space. Now in part two of this topic, we'll do a demonstration on the bench which demonstrates the RF polarization and how a signal tapers off the further we move away from the source, okay? Uh, we'll also do a little bit of antenna modeling and software and of course we'll hear some more from our special guest Sterling Mann. Anyway, you can get a hold of me down in the comments, and as always, you can interact directly with the Element 14 team, including myself, by clicking the link down in the description. That's all for me. We'll see you next time, and have a good one.